All right, hello everyone. So thank you so much for being here. I am so excited about um, my guest today, Dr. Marissa Franco. So she actually was at the 2021 summit and was one of the most um, highly rated sessions because I know that a lot of us in the childless community have um, issues or challenges that come up in our friendships and um, actually just adults in general do. Um, I think it's a lot of people say like, it's so hard to make friends as adults. So I'm just really excited to have her here and to share with us um, some of her tips about friendship. She is an expert in this area. So I was really excited to have received her new book. It's called Platonic, um, How the Science of Attachment Can Help You Make and Keep Friends. And um, I know some of you have picked this up in advance of our conversation. Um, but if you have it, it is a great read. I'm about three quarters of the way through it and have learned so much. So um, yeah, thank you for being here, Dr. Franco. Thank you so much for having me. Really happy to be here. Um, what did I miss in, I didn't really give like a bio bio. What did I miss that you would like everyone to know about you? Um, well, I'm a professor at University of Maryland, teach classes on loneliness. Platonic became a New York Times bestseller, which is awesome. <laughs> And yeah, and I speak on connection and belonging at work, outside of work, how to make friends, stuff we're going to be talking about today. Oh, well, that's incredible. Congrats on the New York Times bestseller list. That is, I mean, an achievement that very few will ever make. And it's just incredible. So congratulations. Thank you, Thank you so much. I want to start, Dr. Franco, by asking you, or just kind of telling you, I guess, that your book is my first introduction to the idea of um, like attachment theory and different styles of attachment. I've heard people talking about it so much. And so I knew that it was like a thing and it was an important thing because I've been hearing about it all over, but um, this was my personal first introduction to it. So it was, it was interesting for me to read through the different styles and be like, okay, where do I fall on this? And it was very easy for me to see that like, sometimes I'm in the secure area, but a, a lot of times if I'm not there, I'm in mostly um, anxious attachment and then come flirt a little bit with avoidance <laughs> if I am like super overwhelmed. Hmm. So this is actually really interesting. I found myself really looking at where people in my life might fall based on the descriptions. And it kind of gave me some context of like, oh, this kind of makes sense why this person might react this way. Or it just was very eye-opening for me. So I'm curious when you were planning out this book, what was it about like attachment theory that made it feel like a good fit for the context of friendship and kind of how you framed it? It's funny because I was first started writing the book by doing a ton of research and I was reading all these studies and finding that, wow, our personalities are a reflection of our experiences of connection or lack thereof. Like whether we're open, trusting, warm, cynical, distrusting, all of those things are predicated on how we've experienced connection in the past. And not only that, those people who have had these healthier connections they develop a set of assumptions that allows them to continue to connect. They are more trusting. They are more comfortable being vulnerable, assume other people will accept them. And my ed I send this to my editor and my editor is like, oh, that sounds like attachment theory that like your personality in some ways is a coping mechanism for your ruptures around yeah. connection. And they continue to affect how you're able to connect in the future. So um, I feel like I kind of, rediscovered it on my own and then was like, oh yeah, this is already a thing that yeah. exists. Um, so yeah, that's how I came to realize that I really wanted it to be the, the thesis of the book. Yeah. Well, it, it does seem like just such a perfect, um, kind of context to, to frame the idea of friendships around. And it made total sense when I was looking through it. Um, I was curious, cause I know when I was reading it, I was thinking about um, experience like I had a pretty chaotic childhood and I could see like I can see how that would have led to this anxious style attachment that I've developed and then also thinking about like oh I've like worked so hard in therapy and like doing all these things to try to like be a really well-adjusted healthy thriving adult and it made me think like I almost felt some judgment um, when I was reading it of myself of like uh, I'm still seeing myself in this anxious category, even though I'm trying so hard to like be a good, healthy person, you know? And so I'm curious, like, are there things that people can do to 
kind of work on getting to that more secure place with their attachment style yeah. or is it kind of like it's set and it's just what you have kind of thing not at all. And I think sometimes when people hear me, I wrote an article for the Atlantic about attachment and the science of how it affects our friendships. And some people were like, screw me then. I guess I had a, you know, a unhealthy childhood and now I'm doomed. And I'm just, that's not what I'm trying to convey. I'm trying to convey that, you know, if you've had an insecure attachment style and you don't understand how that affects how you relate to others, you will continue to think that the issue is just out in the world. Like people can't be trusted. People will abandon yeah. you. That's the kind of thing you'll hear. Yeah. And it's a really disempowering narrative because it suggests that you don't have any agency and you can't do anything about it. And, you know, no matter what happens, people are just going to respond to you negatively. So yeah. I, I think the power of attachment theory is that it gives us agency. It says, okay, if there's ways that I'm contributing to this dynamic, there's ways that I could change this dynamic too. Mm -hmm. so that's why I really love it. Um, and the whole book is kind of about how we can find more secure attachment. And I think your experience is held by a lot of people in that attachment is a spectrum. Um, it's a, I mean, I think it can be a lifelong journey. I don't think anybody's fully secure and you have made progress and that's significant. Um, <laughs> and so, yeah, we can't change judge ourselves based on standards of perfection um, without acknowledging that, you know, you've made a lot of significant progress along the way. So that's important to mention that it's a spectrum and different relationships can bring out different attachment styles because yeah. if you're around someone who's avoidant, which means that they're very uncomfortable with intimacy and they're consistently pulling away from you, it's natural to feel anxious. It is yeah. also a dynamic attachment styles. But now that I've given you a series of disclaimers, I will get to your actual question, which is again, the question of the book, how do you attain more, more secure attachment? And I think yeah. the whole book is kind of about how do you obtain more secure attachment? But the big tip that I share in the book for making friends is to assume that people like you mm -hmm. because when you make this assumption, according to the research, it makes people warmer, friendlier, more open and mm -hmm. becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Whereas insecurely attached people, they're basically going into new relationships, assuming that they're not safe. Yeah. And when we think we'll be rejected, we become cold, we become withdrawn, and it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. People that fear rejection reject people. Um, that's like our defense mechanism against it. So mm -hmm. I think the more that we can approach our relationships with this positive assumption that other people like us, or that when a situation is ambiguous, we're yeah. going to assume that our friend doesn't hate us, that maybe they're just tired <laughs> um, and make that a practice. It is a practice. It's not something that's going to change overnight. That is really the crux of what makes someone secure. Yeah, um, that's so helpful. Thank you. Um, I'm almost thinking about it in terms of like, I also struggle with anxiety and I've learned over the years like different coping mechanisms that I can use to help get myself out of like an anxious state typically usually um and it, it's it's those coping mechanisms and like skills that like my first instinct of how I'm used to reacting I have to kind of be conscious about like okay this may not be the best cope like I have new skills now I've got new coping mechanisms so what can I apply to this situation that's going to be like a more healthy way to approach it and it sounds like it's kind of similar in this regard like you when situations come up when you're going into a new situation you may have to consciously think through like okay I know my first instinct is to just assume that people aren't going to like me and I'm going to I'm going to flip that for myself and and really consciously go into this situation with a different belief or a different like mindset around it does that seem accurate Absolutely. It takes recognizing that you're making the opposite assumption and being intentional about altering it. And I just wanted to mention, because according to the science, people do like you more than you think. Um, I talk about in Platonic, this study where researchers had people interact with strangers. And when they predicted how much the other person liked them at the end of the study, people underestimated how liked they were. Mm. It's called the liking gap. And the more self-critical people were, the more pronounced this liking gap is, suggesting that, you know, you may think that your very critical brain is telling you the truth that nobody likes you, your friends don't really like you, no one wants to hang out with you, you're awkward. But yeah. in fact, the more critical your internal voice is, the more distorting it is of the truth, which is that 
people actually like you a lot more than you think. Hmm. Yeah, that's that's such interesting research. And so glad someone did that because it it definitely can change. I think how you go into situations and are feeling about it. And yeah, like consciously going into it with that belief of like, all right, I think people are gonna like me and I'm gonna I'm gonna enter this situation with that, with that like mind mindset. Yeah. Yeah, it's life changing. And um what you'll realize, I think, is once you try to initiate with people and say like, Hey, I really like talking to you. Would you be open to connecting further? Mm -hmm. Is that people are so much more open to it than you think. And you only know once you do it, like I, I was, you know, like to share about my experience. I traveled to Mexico city solo. And, um, by the end of the trip, I was going to a wrestling match with eight other people because I knew that people like me more than I think I initiated a conversation with someone at a coffee shop and then invited him to, um, to, to go to Spanish language exchange after, and people at that language exchange, I just asked like, Oh, Hey, do you want to go to this wrestling match? And then people at my Spanish class, I asked too, like initiation is half the battle. It's scary to initiate, but it's not as scary as your brain is telling you. Yep. No, absolutely. And I think, um, this is something I have learned over the years because I've lived in I can't remember how many, but like six or seven different cities within the last decade. And so I feel like every couple of years I'm, I'm having to make new friends and like be very conscious about like, okay, I know no one in the city. How am I going to get some friends here? And so, um, I have gotten really good at initiating and just being brave and being, I still won't approach someone like sometimes I'll be at a coffee shop and I'll be like, oh, I wish it was like normal to just be able to go up to a girl and be like, you look so cool. Do you want to hang out? And, and like, <laughs> do you want to be friends with me? <laughs> um, uh, but you know, I haven't done anything like that, but I definitely, you know, I get on Bumble BFF. I go to like meetup groups to, to that like are fit for me. I try to find like classes of things that I'm interested in. And, and it is like a nice way to slowly build, but you can do all of those things. And if you don't initiate those connections of like hey do you want to go get coffee or do you want to like take this to the next step um it almost feels a little bit like dating in that sense like you do have to take initiative and and I think we're kind of taught that friendships happen naturally and they're just they meant just magically like happen to us and come to fruition and and it just doesn't work like that (laughs) yeah and I, I you know I'm just gonna I agree with everything that you're saying and there's research to back it up, which is that studies actually find that people that see friendship happening organically are lonelier over time Mm. because they don't make an effort. Whereas people that see friendship as taking effort are less lonely because they're making the effort. Um, And then also, I think you touched on something called covert avoidance, which is when I was in college, I was like, okay, I'm going to go to this event to make friends. I just talked to the one friend I already knew. Nobody approached me. I thought people are so clicky. I'm not going to connect with anyone here. And I left. But what I wish I knew is that to make friends, you have to not just show up, which means Mm -hmm. you've overcome overt avoidance. Overt avoidance is I'm scared. I'm staying home. But you also have to engage with people when you get there. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's overcoming covert avoidance. If you're covertly avoiding, you're showing up physically, but checking out mentally. And so me at that event was like, I'm not talking to anyone. I'm not, you know, introducing myself. So you have to say, Hey, I'm Marissa. How have you liked this group so far? Tell me more about it. You know, you have to say, Oh, it's been so great to talk to you. I'd love to connect further. Could we exchange contact information? You have to not just show up, but bridge that showing up into a more ongoing connection. Yeah. And I, I have seen that in my own life and I think it's, it, sounds like it doesn't just apply to initial connections, but also I think the idea that the friendships that we do have should just flow or kind of take care of themselves where I've, I've realized that the friendships that I'm able to really retain and stay close to, they require a lot of work. Like every other relationship does, you know, like if you're, if you are kind of passive in your relationships, they're not going to continue to like strengthen and grow. Or if they are, it's because the other person's putting in a lot of work. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You might might be a little resentful too. (laughs) Yeah, well, I, th- I think about this because one of the um, one thing that came up in therapy was I had a relationship with someone in my life who um, I was constantly reaching, reaching, reaching and not getting what I wanted back from them. And my therapist said, it's almost like 
a relationship is like two people holding up a pole and you and you're each holding up your end and sometimes you may hold up to different levels depending on how much you have to give at the time but you're standing here on one end holding up the entire pole that's going you know 10 feet over and that person has dropped the pole they're not putting in any effort and and it was so that metaphor for some reason thinking about it that way um just shifted how I thought about it I was like oh I'm totally doing that like I am putting in all the work in this relationship and the other person is not even trying to meet me halfway at all and so um yeah I'm just thinking about that in terms of effort and like what we give to relationships and yeah I guess that's not really a question but (laughs) yeah no I think it's a great metaphor and I think so many people struggle with that issue around feeling like there's not necessarily that reciprocity and I think specifically, this is a something that I see with like, there's a um, a threat behavior called like fawning, which means not yeah. fight, flight, freeze. Fawn means when you feel threatened, you try to get people to like you. Mm-hmm. And sometimes that, not saying that that's you, I don't know what. I, <laughs> I do can't that. I describe totally your situation that. at all. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> I've been guilty of it too. I think we all have. Um, but what happens? What are the implications of fawning? It means you're investing in relationships with people that aren't invested in you. You're investing Mm -hmm. in relationships that are by definition, not healthy because they're not reciprocal. And those are where you're putting your energies, right? The implications of that is you're inviting unhealthy relationships into your life. So just, you know, just like you said, when I find myself having the urge, that person doesn't like me, it's time to go. I don't know it's time to go like get them to like me, rope them back in. It's time Mm -hmm. to go, you know, show off and get them to like me. I'm like, okay, I'm gonna let that urge pass because I know if I follow this urge, it's not gonna lead me to the right place. And I'm gonna instead channel these energies to the people that are holding up that pole with me. Yep, or find people who will, right? Because I I think um, a lot of my early relationships, like my foundational relationships growing up did have that pattern. And so it's been hard for me to see like, okay, I, that's not what I want anymore. And that's not what it's supposed to look like. Cause I think if you're brought up experiencing relationships in a certain way, it starts to feel like, well, this is what relationships are. And this is what I need to do to like be in them. Um, and so it, 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 it does take a lot of work to kind of shift that and be able to say like, no, there are people that can reciprocate. There are people who will, who will meet me halfway and who value me enough and have the, um, ability to hold up that other side of the pole. And I need to like find those people and invest in them. Exactly. And I think it's important to mention that sometimes people aren't investing because they distrust and they have trouble, um, receiving that other people might like them and they have trouble reaching out themselves. Cause even though you're putting in all this time into them, they still feel like if I, if I give something back, that makes me vulnerable. So, yeah. so yeah, it's not always cause they hate you. It's because we all have our baggage, um, <laughs> yep. to work through too. Um, so yeah, I think it's just helpful to, to have a broader perspective where we can realize that there's larger social forces that are guiding our interactions outside of just yeah. people loving us or hating us. For sure. I mean, I think even with some of the people in my life as an adult, I've seen like this, this can also be their part of their capacity to be, be intimate with someone, not in like a sexual way, but like to have intimacy and to feel that connection and um, that it's not necessarily about me as a person, but this is yeah. something that they struggle with in other areas too. Um, so I saw a question come in kind of related to this on, um, in the chat. So I'm going to ask you this when it came in from an audience member. So this says my issue is that while I'm okay, initiating first, sometimes second, uh, meet up with new potential friends. Uh, after that, I start to panic thinking that these new people will see through the front I'm putting on and realize how boring I am. How can I self coach myself through these thoughts so I can, Uh, let myself nurture these new connections? So one way to find more security is to, like, if you picture that secure person who's loving towards you and never judging you and is so kind to you and you feel like you can share anything with, to begin to cultivate that within, like the ways that you relate to yourself can be like, 
hey, you're actually really lovable. And I know that you're scared and I know that you have some fears, but there's all these experiences you've had in the past where you've, you've shown that people, you can create these relationships with people and that people really like you and don't, you know, don't forget about those. And, you know, just to be with yourself and to be loving towards yourself. There's a great book on this called Self-Compassion by Kristen Neff. And um, she has the whole self-compassion framework, which is like, you have to acknowledge how you're feeling. Like, let's say I'm feeling insecure. You validate that feeling. You know, it's okay if I'm feeling insecure in this moment. Um, it's understandable. New relationships can be scary. And then you use common humanity, which means you acknowledge that whatever you're feeling right now connects you to other people that have also mm -hmm. felt the same way. And often, and that's why I think your community is so great because often when we go through some sort of hardship, we feel shame about it because we feel like yeah. I'm literally unhuman. I feel like this disconnects me from all of humanity in a way that makes me unhuman. Mm -hmm. And when we practice common humanity, we're able to say whatever we feel shame about makes us deeply human. Nobody gets out of this life without feeling uncomfortable emotions, you know, dealing with things, hardships that they didn't really, they were hoping they wouldn't have to deal with feeling insecure. Right. So these insecurities connect me to, to other people that really have felt insecure too. And I also wanted to share that your experience is really normal. Um, there's a, a phenomenon in the psychology research called the mere exposure effect, which is basically the idea that we like people who are familiar to us. Mm -hmm. So these researchers, they would plant these women into a psychology class. And at the end of the semester, no one remembered the woman but they like the woman who showed up for the most classes 20% more than the one that didn't show up for any. We like people when we've been exposed to them. What that means though, is that when we don't have exposure to people, when it's just our first or second time meeting up, our brain is in weary, weary threat mode. We don't trust mm -hmm. people. It's more awkward. It's more uncomfortable. That's part of the process of connection. Like you're right where you need to be. If you're like panicking a little or feeling a little uncomfortable, like that's part of the process of finding comfort. It's not a sign that you need to eject from it. Yeah. Yeah, that's really helpful. Um, thank you. So I'm looking through some of the other questions that have come in and it sounds like um, people are moving into wanting to know more about, okay, if we have um, existing friendships, how do we keep those ones strong? Because we've talked kind of about the initiation piece and um, a bit, but so someone asked, um, you've talked about the key of initiating. What are your thoughts about building friendships to be stronger more than just casual? Mm. So some things that deepen a relationship, um, there's the sociologist, Rebecca Adams. She says for friendships to happen organically, we need to see people repeatedly over time in an unplanned way, like school mm -hmm. or work right? No, we, we didn't have to schedule this in. It's already in our schedule and there's vulnerability. So the more infrastructure we have for that in our lives, the more we're going to create connection for me. Um, so joining a group that's repeated over time, like mm -hmm. finding a hobby or interest that we can pursue in a group is a great way to allow that connection to continue to happen. Being a little bit more vulnerable, sharing things that we're struggling with, with other people. We think it burdens people. In fact, people tend to like us more. And so that makes us closer to people. You know, with me, I, what, what made me motivated to write platonic was I started this wellness group with my friends. So we met up each week to practice wellness, meditate, cook, do yoga, and it was life-changing and it turned us into a group. And so if you want to increase intimacy in your friendships, are there ways you could be more vulnerable sharing things that you're actually struggling with? Are there ways that you can hang out more often, whether that's turning this into a, every week we go on this walk together, or I'm going to join this group. That's, you know, hiking group that meets up every week or improv class or language class or writing class, whatever it is. Um, and then the last piece that I will also share is like anything you do that shows other people that you love and value them creates connection. So mm -hmm. today in my class, I had them compliment each other. And mm -hmm. I just saw that as they gave each other these compliments, like, oh, you have such a grounded energy. I really like that about you. They started to feel safe. And that's what affection yeah. does. It makes us feel secure. It's like, oh, I could be authentic here. You're accepting me as I am. 
And then literally, well, there's this, this theory, risk regulation theory. And the idea is we decide how much to invest in a relationship based on, in part, our likelihood of getting rejected. Mm -hmm. So when we're affectionate toward people, we show them, you're not going to get rejected here. You can invest in this relationship with me. And it facilitates not only us feeling closer to people when we share that affection, but them feeling closer to us because they feel Mm -hmm. safe. Yeah. That completely makes sense. Because even just as you were describing that, I was thinking about some really meaningful things that my friends have done to let me know that they value me. And sometimes that's, you know, when I was going through like infertility that I had a couple of friends that would text me like pretty regularly and just say, Hey, I'm just thinking about you. And I just wanted to let you know that you're on my mind. And it was such like a, a, you know, probably took them like two seconds to put that text together, but it, I still like remember those individual texts coming in because it meant so much to me to just think that like, I was on that person's mind. They were thinking about me. And even though they didn't have like a solution, they couldn't fix anything that I was going through. Just that idea that they thought of me enough to like do that. Um, Or I had friends who would say like, uh, I had a friend tell me a few days ago, which, you know, this was, I haven't, I haven't been in like my infertility journey ended like five years ago. So this is a long time ago, but she told me, yeah, when, when you were going through all of that, I spent a lot of time like looking up how to be a good friend to someone going through infertility and what I should say and just that idea that she cared enough to take some time to educate herself on what I was going through and and how to be a good friend um or I have like a few friends who have told me that they've looked up endometriosis to find out like to learn a little bit more about the chronic illness that I have and and how it impacts me those have been just so meaningful to me because I think it's so rare that someone will take those steps to like show you that they care, especially in um, a friendship where a lot of people approach it more casually. And, you know, maybe you might do that for a sister or like a a partner or like someone who is, um, you know, that close, but like a lot of our friends can be that close, but we don't really think of them as people who who will do that for us. I don't know. Maybe, maybe some people have friends that do that stuff for them a lot. But um, another example is like when I held the first Childless Collective Summit, I had a friend who um, it's actually my best friend who sent me flowers. And she said, I just, I like, you've been here for me at all my important moments. And I know this is a big one for you. And I just wanted to celebrate you. And um, those just meant so much for me. And so I try to think about how am I doing that for other people too? Like, how am I acknowledging what's important to others and what's going on in their lives and making sure that I can reciprocate those things that felt so good to me? Yeah, I call it um, diagnostic moments. So it's either our very low moments or our very high moments that when when an emotion is intense, we tend to remember experiences more. Mm-hmm. So how someone shows up during our diagnostic moments, our low moments, or our very high moments disproportionately affects how we perceive the friendship, which yeah. is why it's just so meaningful when you're just like, I'm sick, I'm struggling with infertility, you know, that someone is being intentional about showing up then that's like a mm-hmm. timing thing. Like it's going to yeah. have so much more of an impact if it's within that timing or even your high moment, you're doing this conference. I'm so happy for yeah. you. I'm so proud of you. Like that people are showing up at that high moment. It's also really important for the friendship overall. Yeah, I mean, definitely. Those are things I'll remember for my whole life. And I think, and I try to think about like, what are those milestones for my friends that I need to be like acknowledging and and making feel special or seen for them too. Um, so, okay, so I've got a big question for you. And I know this um, isn't really like your your area of expertise, but if you have any like kind of general advice for us, Um, One of the things that I see come up most often in the childless community with struggling with friendship, I think, relates to um, like the chapters of your book around authenticity and vulnerability and how important those are in friendships. And one thing that I see is that um, for a lot of us who are childless, the experience is really misunderstood by society generally. Like there's a lot of... um, uh, we call them bingos, but like things that will get said to us, like if, if you know, if you're childless because you're single, you might be met immediately with like, I de- like what you could be differently, do doing differently to find a partner or like dating tips or like, well, you mm-hmm. should be doing this. And it's like that, 
grief gets dismissed and goes straight into like fix it and advice and not really like doesn't really leave you feeling seen um and then the same thing with other reasons you might be childless like I know when I was going through infertility a lot of people met me with like we'll just do IVF or just adopt or like well if you if you aren't doing those things then you obviously aren't it might it must not mean that much to you or like I think the the depth of the grief that I was in went unacknowledged and then also the like intensity of how triggering things that may just be like normal activities for people um like you know being invited to a baby shower being invited to your niece's like one-year-old birthday party um having a friend who's pregnant like share that news with you and talk about what it feels like or how excited she is I think those are things that like can be can trigger that grief so hard that it, it's really difficult because even if you love your friend, you want to be for them there for them, you want to share that with them. It can be just like so painful. I mean, to the point where like research has shown that childlessness can um has has pretty significant rates of coming along with like anxiety and depression and sometimes even like suicidal thoughts. And so um it's it's a weird thing to experience like that level of of grief and kind of like what you're feeling and then you try to talk to someone about it and they just totally don't get it it gets misunderstood or shut down and and you feel very like unseen in your experience and um I have just found that this is so so common that it's one of the it's one of the most common things that comes up so I know it's not just me like there I've heard it from so many people that they try to open up and the response is just not under it's just misunderstanding and and I think that's partly like a societal thing of like we it's something that's still taboo we don't talk about it and people don't really know how to respond to it and so I'm just curious because I'm sure there's other things that might kind of fall into similar categories of of this dynamic and how it can shut friendships down but yeah what happens if the thing that you want need to be talking about and that is your vulnerability and authenticity you do end up with your worst fear of like feeling kind of shut down after that or unseen. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that sounds really hard and really awful to go through, especially feeling like you're being triggered by these things and other people don't understand and they don't see it. It sounds very isolating and very alienating. And there's this concept in the friendship research called disenfranchised grief, which mm -hmm. is the idea that, um, when you have a, a type of grief that society doesn't consider legitimate, then it's harder for you to grieve it because we grieve in community. Other people tell us, I'm here for you and I love you. And then we give ourselves permission to grieve. So I also understand how that could really disrupt your own experience of grieving. Um, yeah, how your question was, what happens if people shut it down? Shut yeah, down. like how if, like I know a lot of your advice was like be vulnerable be be authentic and if this is the area of their lives that they're really feeling like they need to talk about how do they like have that conversation maybe in a way that may could make it like more likely that they're met with understanding yeah on the other side or if they're not sorry not met with that understanding that they like how do you how, what do you do next like I yeah. just see a lot of relationships fracturing because of this, where it, it eventually the communication just happens less and less. And then that re that friendship just fractures and, sure. and they're no longer friends. And I'm just wondering, like, is there something we can do in that moment of like, that's kind of a crisis moment for the friendship. And then there's something yeah. that can happen or that we could try doing differently at that time that could help with the trajectory of yeah. how it continues. You know what I mean? Yeah, I think definitely. Um, so there's this concept called framing, which means approaching this conversation or this um, differences in views in a way that reaffirms that you're doing this because of an act of love and commitment to the friendship. So mm -hmm. I might say something like, you know, and I think in the framing too, you can express your ambivalence, which is I love you and I want to be excited for you. And this is what's coming up for me. That's making it really hard. So yeah, framing is like, 
hey, you know, I um, have been wanting to have this conversation because I want us to remain close. And I realized that, you know, talking about this is really important for me for us to be able to like continue on with all the, all the closest and intimacy we've always had. So would you be yeah. willing to have that conversation? And then when you express um, your perspective, making it about your own experience and what mm -hmm. you're going through, because it is, right? And so yeah. being able to say, and so those I statements instead of you statements, like, you know, I've been struggling with, um, being childless lately and all the grief that has come with that and expressing your ambivalence means, and there's part of me that just wants to be like, so happy for you and so excited for you. But, you know, because of all that I've been going through, I realized that in those moments, I'm actually feeling like really triggered and really sad. Um, and then asking for what you need in the future, you know, saying that maybe, maybe if you want to invite me to the baby shower, like it would mean so much to me if you just acknowledge that this might be hard for me to receive. Like that would, yeah. that would just go such a long yeah. way for me. Like, would you be willing to do that? So mm -hmm. it's having that, I think that disclaimer conversation, it's like before the problem, before you've been triggered a ton of times in this relationship and want to withdraw, mm -hmm. have that conversation earlier, knowing that this is a trigger for you. And this requires you <laughs> to assume people like you, right? Cause you're yeah, assuming- yeah your friends want you to feel good interacting with them and your friends um, want to help you not feel as triggered around them. And your friends want to be safe places for you, um, yeah. which is really, really important to get yourself to be able to have some of these difficult conversations. I would say, honestly, if a friend is just like, man, if you said that to me and I was just like, I don't get why you're so triggered. Or maybe you could tell me some of the, some of the types of responses that people receive in this situation. I think a big one is like, I just had a baby. How are you making this about you kind yeah. of thing? I think that's a big one where it's like, I'm excited. I just had a baby. And now you're talking about your grief again, kind of thing. I think that's one where it's like, uh, they take offense that like, yeah, it, 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 yeah. that it becomes offensive, like that it, yeah. Yeah, I, I believe healthy conflict involves de-escalation, which isn't mm -hmm. always easy and is uh, probably feels pretty shitty if you're like in a state of grief for so long and now you have yeah. to also help regulate the other person. But mm -hmm. I might say something like, you know, I am really excited about you and I totally wish yeah. I could make this all about you in this moment because I love you so much. Um, you mm -hmm. know, unfortunately, these triggers are coming up for me and it's if I could control them, I totally would. Um, but I'm feeling like I'm still really struggling with them as hard as I try, which is why I'm, yeah. I'm reaching out to you and I, I'm asking for this change. Right. So you're not, yeah. you have to make sure you're not in me versus you mode. You're in yeah, collaborative yeah. mode. We're trying to mm -hmm. reconcile and come yeah. together around this. <laughs> in this that moment. Makes sense. Yeah. I think the other thing that I see really commonly is the advice. So instead of like, acknowledging why this would be painful or why we're experiencing a lot of grief. Um, a lot of times, like I said, if there's someone who's single, they might get automatically just like, well, here's how to find a partner. Like, what have you tried this? Why aren't you doing this? Or if it's um, around infertility or like other reasons that someone might be childless, it's like, well, you should just adopt and blah, 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 or, or like kind of platitudes that are, are just kind of like, well, if you want it enough, it's going to happen. And for those of us who it's Ugh. like, we've already exhausted all of our options and we've already like, we have come to terms that we're going to be childless. We are, we are like, that is our new reality. And it, it almost feels like sometimes our loved ones can't shift with us where they're still on the track of like the only way they see hope or happiness for us is to have that baby outcome. And it's hard to get that shift to happen where it's like, Hey, I'm like on this new path now of like, I want to find, I want to figure out how to make a life that I love without kids I need you to like flip with me and like support me in this. But I feel like a lot of times it just stays on the track of like solutions. Like I know um, with, with, I have someone in my life that um, is, is a family member. And even now five years post hysterectomy, a lot of times when I see her, she'll say like, well, why haven't you adopted yet? We we're willing to pay for it. Or like I still have an ovary left. So she'll still ask me like, when, why, why don't you do an IVF cycle and retrieve eggs? And then I would pay for you to get a surrogate. So she's like still looking for solutions to trying to get me to a baby, even though I've explained to her many times over the last five years, like, Hey, I'm not interested in pursuing this anymore. I'm 
literally have like an organization now of like <laughs> this is my job is like provide support to this community and I still can't figure out how to get her to stop like trying to get me to have a baby still in whatever like way possible so I know sorry that was very long-winded but I guess like the short answer is like um the the grief and like reality is dismissed and it goes into like advice giving and like hey I still see hope for you having a baby like you just got to shift and do these things or where yeah. it's like I'm not on that track anymore yeah that sounds very frustrating and um like you're banging your head against the wall for a yeah. very long time <laughs> <laughs> And I think when, you know, when we clearly express a boundary over and over and over again, and someone isn't fulfilling it, we can decide, I think to the, ex what degree do we want the relationship in our life? Like, it's yeah. not binary. It's not like, yeah, yeah. oh, well, you can't respect this boundary. So, I'm, you know, we're kicking you to the curb, but it might be, okay, this person doesn't respect this boundary. So maybe we hang out a little less or we see each other a little less because mm -hmm. of this. So, and, and that's what I love about friendship. It's like, I don't know if this is a situation with this person in your life, but, you know, in friendship, at least you can um, dial down intimacy instead of cutting off intimacy. Yeah. I call them my Lotus friends. I like you at Lotus once a month. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Uh, but I, I think in general, when you're expressing a boundary, because it is hard um, to say something in the moment, but I like the appreciation and expressing a need approach to a boundary. So the appreciation yeah. is not about the content of what they're saying, but the underlying emotion that might be, they're trying to be hopeful for you mm -hmm. and they want the best for you. And so that appreciation is, you know, I really appreciate that you want the best for me in this situation. I really appreciate that you hold on to a lot of hope for me. And what I feel like I would be most helpful for me or what I feel like would really make me feel better is if we could accept that I'm not going to be having a child going forward. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think the appreciation and the need is kind of like a, a relational approach to, to boundary setting. Mm -hmm. That's really good advice. And, um, what something, something that you said reminded me, the low dose thing reminded me of, um, something my therapist, my therapist is great. So I keep coming Sounds back to like him, it. but, um, <laughs> he was, he one time said to me in a therapy session, like, you know, one thing I'm noticing about you is that you want every relationship that you have in your life to be at a 10 all the time. Mm. And that's not realistic. And I think you need to acknowledge that there's like some relationships in your life that are always going to be a five is like best year they're going to get to. And that's okay. It doesn't mean that like, there's, there's like, it doesn't mean that it's necessarily like, bad. It's just like, I have within me, like, I love the authenticity. I love the like deep intimacy in all my relationships. And so I do like, my preference is to like, have those very intense, intimate, like deep friendships or like relationships with everyone in my life. That's, that's my ideal. And so the idea of like, okay, some people are in that either low dose category or like maybe you you aren't going to have that level of intimacy that you want ever because for whatever reason, like they're not capable of it. They don't, they don't want it at that level that you do. So like being okay with the fact that like, I can still enjoy this person's company and get a lot out of this relationship, even if it's at like a five. Exactly. And it's being on your own side, right? Like mm -hmm. being on your own side means okay, if someone's not giving me the level at which I need, I don't try to keep pushing it. And I, I let that relationship be because that's an act of love for myself to not feel like I'm, you know, pursuing ends with people that are not going to be met or developing these expectations yeah. that are going to continue to go unmet. Like that's an act of love for me. <laughs> that's mm -hmm. me being on my own side, accepting yeah. the relationships that should be a two or a four or even a six. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So we'll, I want to kind of um, continue down this road a little bit. Um, and this is something that came, has come up a lot, which is, um, one thing I found is that like having a baby can be one of the most life-changing things that can ever happen to you. And it's a very like core part of your identity and just like daily life and how you're spending your time and what you're thinking about and all of that. And that all totally makes sense. If I had become a mom, I would have been totally engrossed and absorbed in that experience too. Cause you're like 
literally having to have like you're responsible for a tiny thing surviving like that needs 24 7 attention so like I understand how time consuming and um, kind of all encompassing it is I think one thing that um, for those of us who are childless find is that this kind of it feels like such a huge division in terms of like we had this friend and we had like things that we talked about and we had norms of like let's go out for coffee and just sit and chat for three hours and like having time for each other, all these things. When one person becomes a mom and the other is still childless and going to be childless, um, I've seen a lot of the disconnect comes from just what the lifestyle shifting so hugely that um, a lot of the time we may feel like our, our friends, her moms don't have time for us anymore um when we do see them they just talk about like their kids they some of them may not show like really interest in our lives or what's going on it just becomes like everything gets funneled into like motherhood and I think you know we talked about the grief part where like those things are going to hit on our grief but also it's just so different from like the friend that we knew and Mm -hmm. the experiences that we had from with them and so I'm just curious um like is there are there ways to like bridge those gaps of like being able to I don't know like a few things I've thought through are and it's funny because it is I do kind of tend to couch it in the way that you said which is saying like hey I know that you are so busy right now and and you know you're such a great mom I'm seeing all that you're doing and investing in in your kid and it's like so beautiful and Um, I'm also just missing you a lot. Like, you know, we used to have so much time together and I feel like we haven't talked in so long. Do you think that we could schedule like a 10 minute phone call sometime when like you won't be interrupted and we can just like have a few minutes to just chat and and connect or like, I don't know, like just trying to think of like how, how can we meet each other part way, acknowledging how much their life has changed and that they're, they're not able to like go get three hour coffees with us anymore. Maybe. Yeah. Um, And that they do, they are going to want to talk about their kids sometimes, but like, we don't want it to be all the time. Like, can we still talk about other things too? So Mm -hmm. I guess that's the question is like, how do we meet them halfway, Mm -hmm. acknowledging their reality, but also helping them see our reality and like come to some ways that it feels good for both of us to keep the friendship going. Yeah. So I feel like what you're getting at is this, this concept of healthy friendship that's called mutuality, which means it's not necessarily that I'm always getting my needs met, but I'm thinking about your needs and my needs at the same time and mm-hmm. whose are more urgent in this moment. Um, and so sometimes it's going to be yours. Sometimes it's going to be mine. Sometimes I'll yeah. sacrifice. Sometimes you'll sacrifice. But the important thing is that both people's needs are being considered and it's not just one person getting their needs met all the time, right? So, So mutuality means that, oh, if our friend has a kid, we acknowledge that, okay, they have less time, they have less Mm -hmm. resources, right? And so what we might, if we have more flexibility, then that might mean that we need to be a little bit more accommodating than they can be in this moment. That being said, I love how you approached it, first of all, because it sounds very mutual. (laughs) You acknowledge that reality and you asked for something that was reasonable for both parties. I mean, 10 minute phone call, I think that they can do that. (laughs) So I think that's a great example of that. (laughs) But I also think it's important to mention for you to be so accommodating, you need to make sure your needs are being met elsewhere. Like fawning. Can... Yeah. <laughs> Is that fawning if I'm like <laughs> asking for the bare minimum? <laughs> I mean, not, not if, you know, not if it's coming from a place like fawning comes from a place of fear and anxiety rather yeah. than from a place of like love and understanding. So yeah. that's the root of the fear. Okay. That's good. Um, that's good to know the differentiation. Yeah. Yeah. And I think making sure that, yeah, you can accommodate this friend that's, you know, having this tiny baby and is very busy, but making sure you're taking care of yourself by finding relationships with people who can give you this coffee hours that you're looking for, who do have the time to spend with you, who do have more flexibility in their schedule, because that's, what's going to help you be more accommodating towards this friend that doesn't, because you're not Mm -hmm. relying on them and them alone to fulfill this deep psychological need. That's going to go unmet if they're not able to do it. So that's why friendship is beautiful because we have a mosaic of people to meet our needs. And that's why I think this community is beautiful for childless people to meet other childless people who might have more capacity for friendship at this Mm -hmm. given time. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I, I saw, I wish I could find this again. I've never been able to find it, but I end up talking about it all the time. I um, was one time doing a workshop and I found this like questionnaire that asked a bunch of questions about like, who do you call when you're having a bad day? Who do you call when you have a flat tire? Who do you call when like you just need a good laugh? Or who do you call when you want to have that like three hour coffee date? Like it had a whole bunch of different categories. And then at the end, it was like, if you put down the same one or two people for like almost all the answers, then your support system isn't big enough. Mm. And it was this idea that like, it's not just about the support you get, but it's also that if you put down one or two people, you are expecting too much of them. And it's going to be it's going to be too much for them to like that. Like if you're expecting that your partner or your mom or your best friend or whoever it is that, that they're your person, that's like, they can't meet all of your needs. And if the expectation is that they're the one you're going to go to for every single one of those things, you're expecting like too much from just one or two people. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, exactly. And it's, you know, I don't know, we have this like perception of it in like, marriage that you rely on one person for all your needs but we find that the people that do that their marriage is harmed by it and um, they're more impacted by conflict in the marriage because they don't have support outside of it their Mm -hmm. mental health is worse than people that are diversifying their network of support so I think that that's really important and like really in order for us to give grace we need to have our needs met (laughs) somewhere like you can't give grace it's like giving grace is like I don't know, giving something up to someone else. And if you have nothing for yourself, how could you give something up for to, to that other person? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That absolutely makes sense. Um, I'm looking at my phone cause I've got, I know we have like four minutes left, but I have a question that I really liked that came in in advance that I'm trying to find. Um, okay. Actually. So, so it's, it's going back to the attachment styles. I hope that's okay. Sure. Let's um, go. So somebody said, much of the attachment research about how to change attachment styles is focused on partner and romantic relationships and families, either families of origin or the families that the family that you create. Is it possible for someone who does not have an intimate relationship or children or a healthy family of origin to gain secure attachment and how? Yes. Yes, absolutely. Um, anybody can find secure attachment. In the research, it's called earn secure. So you earn that sense of security with other people. And I think this kind of relates to our last question about being able to um, assume people like you being one of my points, but also the other point that I shared about finding an internalized sense of security. So are you finding ways to that loving attachment figure you didn't have to begin to cultivate that within and embody Mm -hmm. that in yourself, um, treat yourself that way, like sit with your own emotions, validate your own emotions. There's a form of therapy called internal family systems that is Mm -hmm. kind of about, (laughs) yeah, about, um, doing this for yourself. And, And part of it is that we all have this higher self that is connected and is secure and is grounded and it never goes away. And the the form of therapy is about witnessing all of your other selves, your childhood self, your hurt self, your angry self from the perspective of this higher self. So this higher Mm -hmm. self could give the love and support that we didn't get from other people. Like sometimes we need, we obviously need things from other people, but we can also give those things to ourselves internally. And so I think finding security is about doing that. Like, are you going through life? Like you're on your own side. Mm -hmm. that sounds a little bit similar to I keep seeing stuff about I think they call it reparenting or like parenting yourself is that kind of a similar idea it totally is yeah like you know going back and experiencing that five-year-old self and and picturing yourself being that loving force for that kid so I definitely recommend therapy I think you know getting some help with this is certainly really important yeah. Okay. Um, I'm going to try to sneak in <clears throat> one last quick question because I think this is a really good one too. So someone um, said that in another podcast, you talked about there being three different kinds of loneliness. And um, she was saying for someone who is single and um, childless, not by choice, intimate loneliness is a really serious thing. Most of us are lonely for living life without someone. 
the companionship, familiarity, regularity, intimate touch, non-sexual and sexual, and the yep. shared life project of raising a family. Um, what, if any, if anything, can someone in this position do to improve this type of loneliness, or is just something that someone in this position needs to grieve and then learn to be okay or enough with, with the other kinds of connections? I, I hear you. First of all, like the way our society sets up, it's like, if you don't have a partner, you're just at a disadvantage legally. Right. I mean, you're not getting married. You're not getting all those tax cuts and all those other benefits. So first of all, this is a systemic issue and it's not your fault. If you are feeling like intimate loneliness is lacking for you, if you don't have a relational partner, there are so many benefits in our society that are only given to people that have romantic partnership. And there's an assumption that our romantic partner is the person that we care for, that we show up for first and foremost. And that, you know, if you're a friend of someone who gets into a romantic partnership, you have to just adjust to not being cared for as much, right? You just have to adjust to that. And so it is a social failing that is really contributing to this. And I understand, and I think your feelings are so, so valid. I will say that, um, since studying friendship, uh, it's really kind of altered the way that I see the potential for friendship in that I think queer communities have taught me that family is a social construct and that you can choose someone to embody all of the things that you would associate with a family mm -hmm. and that people are, are choosing friends as life partners at increasing rates and increasing degrees. And there's no reason why you can't take the structure that you apply to um, a romantic partner and apply it to a friend or apply it to someone else in your life. It takes bravery. I mean, you're gonna have to take the risk of like asking and seeing yeah. if they would be down for that type of partnership. It might be a little easier if you start by separating out the needs that you really have that you would get a partner to fulfill and asking mm -hmm. someone for that need specifically. Like, okay, I want someone to pick me up at the airport. Like, would you be down for us to be airport buddies where we're going to be yeah. invested in picking each other up at the airport. Or I think it's possible to like bring physical touch into friendship. It's something mm -hmm. I've been working on for me because I know I've always associated physical touch with sexual touch. And I, yeah. I wish that my body had that separation because I think it would really benefit us all if we could just normalize physical touch. It's not sexual. Um, yeah. So yeah, it might take asking a friend um, to cuddle if that's something that you're interested in. Um, <laughs> yeah. So yeah, being able to like separate out those needs and ask for them within friendship and it's risky mm -hmm. and it's exposing, mm -hmm. but it's, it's not going to happen, unfortunately, because of our, the social structure and the way we perceive relationships, unless we're able to ask for it. Yeah. Oh, that's such a beautiful answer. Um, and it, it kind of reminds me of some things that came up in a book that I have um, by Mia Birdsong called How We Show Up. And if someone ends up buying that book, just know she is a mom. She talks a lot about motherhood and both her and others, but she also talks about, I think this idea you said, um, Marissa, about like the kind of, uh, I think she calls it like queering relationships where it's like that idea of like things that we would normally have boundaries around for this person fulfills this, this type of person fulfills this, that it's kind of like mixing those up a bit and expanding what we mean by family and what, what roles our friends or like other people have in our lives. So um, if you're interested in that, I thought that was a, a really nice book. Um, but go get Dr. Franco's book because it's amazing. So again, it's called Platonic. And um, I have absolutely been loving it. I've learned so much and um, it's just a gem. So go pick it up. I know we didn't get to like even half of the questions that came in. So I'm <laughs> sorry about Thanks that. For great questions. Um, but besides the book, I know you're, you're active on Instagram. You have really fun, like, um, reels and like little tips for people there. Are there other ways that you'd like for people to connect with you? Yeah. So on my website, drmarissagfranco.com, that's D-R-M-A-R-I-S-A-G-F-R-A-N-C-O. You can take a quiz that assesses your strengths and weaknesses as a friend, gives you some suggestions, or if you want to reach out about speaking on how to make friends or how to find belonging at work, feel free to reach out. And Dr. Franco, especially thank you for being here. I know that this topic is one that really um, resonates with our community. And I really appreciate the time that you gave to us to answer some of our questions. It was my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Bye, Thank everybody. You. Bye.